You are watching the Pan African Daily TV with Dr. Susan Tata. The Africa we want. Unity, consciousness, our culture, our spirituality, our history. One Africa for Africans worldwide. Motherlands calling its diaspora home. Join my voice. Join my team. Join my campaign. Campaign 21 hashtag 1 million subscribers on the Pan African Daily TV YouTube. Be a volunteer. Apply now. Be the new Africa. So, so, so. Welcome, welcome, everyone. <laughs> I'm just laughing because Tumi is sitting here and just repeating everything that our image video is talking about. Pan African Daily TV, 1 million subscribers on our YouTube. Subscribe now, be a volunteer, you know. And so it was just fun. I mean, getting to me again for all this while, he's just started his career as a banker here in Germany in one of the most prestigious community banks here. And so this young son of us is going to be been assisting us on the technical or the Pan African Daily, but also engaging in which sector is the money going to. So, welcome to the Pan African Daily TV tonight. Um, it's an honor, it's an honorable day, and I want to wish all of us the Afros, yes, as you can see, the biggie. <laughs> we call us the big hair, the big hair people. Today is the World Afro Day 2021, and we've been hashtagging and celebrating our Afro. Of course, I did actually went straight to say it's the Woman's Day, but of course, I was so attacked by the king saying, hey, come on, Dr. Susan, it is the Afro. When are we going to be celebrating the World Locks Day, you know, like our regular locks and stuff? When are we going to be celebrating the World Head Tie, Head Scarf Day in African Day? So you see, we are in that period where everything about us has to be in the front line. So I want to wish all of you out there rocking your afros. It doesn't matter, colors and shapes and sizes. Just go ahead and enjoy that day. I want to also wish Dr. Isaac Zama, who is sitting here with us, you can see his own afro in good shape yes and that is the millennium that is the decade of the african people worldwide so go ahead and don't be afraid of your identity don't be ashamed of it rock it as much as you can as much as possible push it into those eyes they don't want to see you they will see you whether they like it or not okay so yes i want to thank all of you for joining in on this conversation today uh today like i said yesterday we're going to touch based on agriculture and so when we say agriculture it's a lot of a big topic but this expert sitting here is not the first time being here yes the first time as a guest but it's one of the oldest followers from day one that we launched the pan-african daily tv if you have heard someone that has always been calling up to the point that he can call during the show four times until i put notice of his name and i put a hashtag on that name most often when i pick the calls he will be calling and calling and calling you see because he was so so conscious and oriented particularly when we were talking about topics of agriculture you know and community and rural development and how to use the natural things that we have to be able to feed ourselves dr zama isaac was always the one bringing input on the show each time rutendo would come up or dr tata would Come, uh, experts that we know are actually uh, the ones calling us in terms of uh, or empowering us in the sector of agriculture and growing our own natural organic seeds by using what we have being in terms of biogas you know production how do we use urine or what how do we use insects or whatever so he's right here 
And what you expect to be doing now is just to get yourself seated. Because now today, it's not going to be about, oh, people do us this or systems have done us this. No, we're going from that talk to practical actions. Are you ready with your budget to engage in Africa or in agricultural sector, which is the biggest and the fastest growing? Do you even have an idea that the richest sector in the world today has to do with food? what you eat because at every point in time you can never go without food and now you see even some you know i mean these people they are just i don't know they even start transforming food into tablets and they start telling oh you know you don't even need to eat these vegetables but you can just take a tablet and you're good to go you don't even need to buy fruits bananas pineapple mangoes like what we have in the continent no 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 we've just wrapped them in some kind of a tablet and you take one and you're good to go what nonsense dr zama is here he's gonna tell you it's a whole fake damn lie all those things are never gonna help you you need to grow your own food and particularly the fact that you need to trust what you grow so you're gonna pay much much attention i hope all of you are connected nasha is connected and is ready on the chat and so wherever you're connecting from the diaspora the mainland continent the uk the europe the asian the mainland the middle east you are welcome to this particular show with dr zama i'll go back to the studio uh, with my honorable guest today dr zama you're welcome well, uh, well uh, thank, you thank you so much, so much. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Susan. Dr. Susan. Uh, it, uh, it seems as if I'm getting an echo. Um, maybe let me figure out what was the problem here. But um, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to the Pan-African Daily TV. Uh, it's a pleasure to you know be here and meet everybody. And I hope uh, we're going to have an excellent time. But in the meantime, uh, let me go ahead and congratulate the Pan-African Daily TV of hitting the milestone of a million subscribers, which um, we keep praying every day that, you know, hopefully by 2021 or 2022, everybody on the continent or in the diaspora should be a member of the Pan-African Daily TV. So that you know, congratulations again to the Pan African Daily TV for the wonderful work you're doing. You know, trying to bring us together, uh, you know, to see what we can do, you know, to help our mother continent prosper. Thank you very much. I mean, we seem very like far, and like any other audience or experts that we've been having here, you are one of the closest neighbors that I have. I mean, even though we're talking on camera, but if we look at our geographical location, can it happen that we are very close neighbor? We grew up in the same neighborhood in Cameroon, Southern Cameroon. Can it be? Absolutely. You know, um, for for those of us, or for the, for for the, for your for your audience who know Bamenda, uh, we grew up in Tamulung uh, uh, and Tamulung roundabout. And you grew up in Sonak Street, which is um, a stone throw. Uh, we'll take the back roads from Tamil Runabout and then go down to Sonak Street when we are going to town or, or we are going, uh, or, or when we used to go to Idol Park, or, I mean, uh, Idol Park Hotel, or, um, you know, you, you remember the nightclub Idol Park, or when you're going to uh, Zenon, which was just, um, you know, down down the roundabout there. So, um, you know, we, we're very, very close and, uh, uh, thanks to the the, the, wonder, the the wonders of technology, we are still that close uh, even after 40 years. But you see, you're describing um, uh, this particular uh, town, this iconic town that is on the world global map where we all grew up, where we all know. And you're talking about this wonderful people and the location and even the distance across the road. But it's not longer that like that since five, six years ago, isn't it? Yes, unfortunately, unfortunately, um, there has been uh, a war that has been going on between uh, the Southern Cameroonians and, and, and what we call La République de Cameroon. Um, for those who don't know, um, Southern Cameroons and La République de Cameroon formed a federation in 1961. And um, when they formed the federation, 
uh, the Southern Cameroons was twenty makes up twenty percent of the population of what most people out there would know as Cameroon, and um, and the French speaking part of the country they form uh, 80 percent of the population. So um, the the these two entities formed a federation. There were there were two. Uh, uh, independent countries that in the infinite wisdom of the United Nations uh, conducted um, a referendum in 1961, you know, requesting that these two people, these two uh, uh, entities uh, form a federation, which, uh, which they actually did in 1961. And in 1961, you know, they had a constitution that, that, that governed, um, you know, the, 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 the terms of union between um, these two countries. Yeah. Um, but as 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 the union went on, uh, the francophones or the French part of the country, because they were in a majority, because um, the president was uh, from the French speaking part of the country, um, they went ahead and abrogated, you know, the, the you know the federal constitution, which uh, guaranteed certain rights to the anglophone or the English speaking minority. And since um, 1972 up to today, uh, the Southern Cameroonians or the English-speaking Cameroonians have been, for lack of a better term, being treated as slaves. That is what it is. And um, and so the, the leaders of Southern Cameroons uh, have done tried all kinds of peaceful ways or means of dialoguing with the French-speaking uh, government to ensure that um, the you know the culture of the English speaking uh, um, Cameroon was was respected, um, but you know all of these attempts fell on um, on deaf ears. And uh, in 2016, um, what uh, the teachers and lawyers actually took uh, you know protested because um, they were sending French uh, teachers. To go into into the English part of the country and teach five six year olds or, 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 or twelve year olds in French. That's a language that you know kids have you know they've never known, and you know somebody who speaks French doesn't speak any English at all. You send them to go teach, you know, kids in that uh, in that language, and so um, you know the parents uh, started protesting. It was the same thing with lawyers, you know. Um, in, in Cameroon, you have two legal systems. You have the common law, which uh, which is uh, fashioned after the English system, and then you have the civil law, which is fashioned after the, the you know the French system, because those were our colonial masters, and so we adopted their legal systems. So um, you know this is something that has been going on. But in 2016, um, they actually started sending French judges to go into our courts and start administering this, the common law in a, in a French language, which can you imagine your mother, she grew up in the English speaking, she's never been, she, she doesn't understand French, she doesn't understand the procedure. She, a judge comes and she goes to court and they start talking to her in a foreign language, in, in French, that she doesn't understand. How would she feel? So those were the precursors of the conflict, and so um, in 2016, when teachers and um, and the lawyers started post, uh, uh, protesting, what did the French government do? They, uh, you know, they started violence. Um, you know, the some of the leaders that were that were trying to negotiate with the with the government, they were arrested and thrown in, in thrown into jail, and um, um, in 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 October 2017. Um, you know, when the Southern Cameroons were cel celebrating their, their, their independence because um, they, they, the Southern Cameroons always consider the 1st of October as their independence day. Um, on that day, uh, you know, our mothers, our young brothers and everybody at home came out in their different uh, regalia, you know, saying that, you know, they were celebrating their independence. What did the French government do? They sent out hel helicopter gunships. Helicopters were flying above people and shooting them, killing them like goats. And so that is how the war started. And um, the young people at home who have been marginalized all through their lives, 
you know, started defending themselves. You know, some, you know, picked up Dane guns and, you know, you know, trying to defend their mothers who, who were being killed, you know, defending, um, you know, their, their, their younger sisters who were being molested at the University of Boya, uh, being, um, you know, somewhere raped, uh, you know, getting students and um, robbing them in sewage. You know, can you imagine a university student, um, they would arrest you and, you know, take your face and, and put it in sewage. And things like that. So those were some of the indignities which our people went through that the younger people said no. The younger boy, the young boys said no, um, this is too much. And so um, you know, they started with, with uh machets, you know, with den guns, and um uh by 2000, by January 2018, um, you know, they kidnapped our leader, um, Mr. Siseko Ayuktabe. You know, from Nigeria and brought you know with ten others, ten ten members of his team, and uh, you know they brought them to Yaounde, and so um, after that, you know, the war just escalated, and um, you know the young guys uh, that they call them the Amba Boys, um, they, they said you know they were going to defend um, you know their territory, and uh, that is why you see that um, they are the you know the Amba Boys or the Amba soldiers. They remain in southern Cameroons. They've not crossed into French Cameroon. So that that is a little background of you know to answer your question why um, Bamenda that we all grew up in or Tamlung specifically, which is our own neighborhood, has been embroiled in this war for the last five years. Thank you so very much. Um, I mean, of course, the audience on the Pan African Daily TV is so versed with this situation because these are conversations that we touch the uh, conflict on the continent wherever it is. Um, it is. It is the way it is, and um, it is either peace or nothing, <laughs> justice or war. Justice. Justice. Yes. So it is it is those kind of solutions that we're looking for. And I see the way you're trying to address your own by bringing, you know, one of the most strategic uh, developmental aspects, which is feeding the population. And despite this war, despite this gruesome situation in the Southern Cameroons, but you're doing everything to stay in touch with the people to make sure that they grow their crops, they feed themselves, that the mothers are up to date, irrespective of all the challenges or the killings and the murders that they're going through. You stick to your plan of developing these communities amidst this challenge uh, to make sure that you know, the tension is reduced, but also to make sure that this uh, uh, people are alive. But it's not only in Southern Cameroons that you're doing it. I see you have a, a, a program called Amber Farmers, where you're also connecting the whole of Africa to teach them how to just, you know, grow their own simple things in the community, in the village, right up to the uh, 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 town shape how they can develop seed. So I think that's the topic that we're really gonna focus on that. How do you stay focused in a, in a zone where you know, even your mother is a risk, your grandmother, they're burned, children are being kidnapped and killed and people are chased out of their country, but you say, no, yes, I focus on that, but I want to make sure that my people have what to eat they have to focus on the only thing that no other person can take it away from them how do you manage that well um Mas Susan, um the greatest thing that nobody will ever take from you is knowledge you know they can they, they can they can they can seize your car somebody can seize your land somebody can seize your your watch but what is in your head, nobody can take away from you. Absolutely. And, and so it is from that perspective that, um, you know, we are approaching, um, you know, the, you know, the idea of educating or helping our people go through this crisis. And um, yes, uh, you, you, you know, you talk about Amber Farmer's voice. Um, Amber Farmer's Voice came up, the idea for Amber Farmer's Voice came up because um, when the war started, we had 
thousands and thousands of refugees. Uh, by um, by recent estimates, um, the, 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 the UNHCR, United Nations High Commission for Refugees, estimates that we have almost 80,000 refugees in Nigeria. We have uh, 1.5 million internally displaced. That is Southern Cameroonians who are victims of this war, who have moved into the French speaking part of the country uh, because it's, it's, a, it's a little safer. Uh, we have uh, thousands of Southern Cameroon refugees in Ghana. And there are some that are in Gabon. There are some that are spread across uh, Central and West Africa and uh, in the diaspora. So when these people, um, when these people were displaced, the question of food became paramount. Mm. You know, if you have 80,000 refugees in Nigeria, we in the diaspora, we you cannot feed all of them in a month. We cannot, no, no, no matter how much money you have. So, you know, agriculture being my own domain, and um, I figured out how can I come up with uh, something that could help them wherever you are, on the continent that you could actually use to, um, you know, to, to have something to eat. Even if you don't have money, at least you can grow pepper, you can grow tomatoes, you can grow vegetables anywhere you are, irrespective of, the, of, of, of your situation. So it was because of this war that we came out with Amber Farmer's Voice. And lucky for us, um, you know, the Southern Cameroonians, they had their own TV station called um, the Southern Cameroons Broadcasting uh, Television or Corporation, SCBC TV. And so mm -hmm. in collaboration with um, SCBC TV, we produce agricultural programs that bring practical and simple uh, ideas for people to grow food in very challenging uh, situations. Let, 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 me, let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. uh, we have 1.5 million of our people in French Cameroon who are squatting, uh, you know, in the cities. They're, they're living 10 people in a, in, in a one-bedroom and things like that. How can, you, how can somebody who has been um, managing to survive in Douala or in Yaoundé or in Bafusam accommodate nine, ten people. But if you can, if, wherever you live, if you find a broken bucket, or or if you if you pick if you go to trash and you pick up uh, an empty rice bag, okay, you you come back, you look for soil. You put it, you put the soil in this empty rice bag or an empty bucket or whatever you want, any container. You put soil inside, you water it. If you plant tomatoes, it's going to grow. If you plant pepper, it's going to grow. If you plant Irish potatoes, it's going to grow. So for, you know, to support this uh, internally displaced who have gone to these other parts without, uh, they don't have land where they can go and grow something. Um, we, we came up with this idea of, you know, educating them that go to the trash and look for empty bags. Or there's, there's, there's these bags called Ghana must go. You know, the people use them and throw them. So you can pick some of those, even if you don't have land, you know, you can line them along the wall, wherever you live, and uh, and and you put soil inside. You you go look for you you, you go to where the where where they dump trash. Um, some of those places trash has been dumped there for you know for decades, and so the trash has um, uh, uh, has decayed and it's become good organic soil. So if you get some, you put them in this bucket. Or in these Ghana go bags, or in this um, uh, uh, rice empty rice bags, you put them there. Look for um, a tomato seed, look for pepper seed, and you plant it. Look for green, look for njama njama. You plant it there; it will grow very well. And so then you'll be able to complement whatever you are, uh, you know, you know, uh, you're earning. Or uh, I mean, for for people who have houses, you'll be able to get those vegetables, and complement it with either plantains that you're buying from the market, so that you can feed your family. So, 
you know, those, you know, that, that, that it is because of the situation that, you know, we came out with Amber Farmer's voice, you know, to make people, to open their eyes to think that irrespective of where you are, the situation that you are in, you can still grow food. You may not have money to buy anything, but at least you can grow something so that, you know, you can, at least you have something to eat. Life is what is most important, staying alive. And, you know, to stay alive, you have to eat. And so, you know, to eat, you can do these little things and grow food. And so, you know, those were some, you know, those are some of the early things that, uh, you know, that we thought about letting our people know uh, those who were in difficulties, you know, to do so that, you know, they can survive until, you know, while they struggle to, you know, to find their feet. So those are some of the um, re some of the things that, you know, we sought to bring, uh, you know, to the, uh, you know, to the attention of our people. So um, through Ambassador Farmer's Voice, it's a, it's a program that we, that we produce every Sunday uh, at 4 p.m. Um, uh, um, uh, Cameroon time, or let me call it Cameroon time, or Southern Cameroon time. So uh, it, we produce it every Sunday at um, 4 p.m. And we have different topics. You know, uh, we, we have shown people how, you know, they can go to the trash and they'll pick up empty tires and use that to grow snails, what we, what we call at home Nyamongoro. And because, you know, they, they, they don't have money, they need to eat protein and snails is very good protein. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we teach them how to go, you know, to this uh, trash and pick up old tires, come and put them behind their houses and, um, you know, go to the bush and, and, and get two giant snails and, you know, put them there, feed them with fresh grass. And before you know it, you have a colony of snails. And let me tell you, snails is very, very expensive meat. Correct. <laughs> Ask anybody. Yeah. What are, you, what can't are you, even buy it. you can't even buy it out here. That's right. So uh, ask anybody in Lagos. Ask anybody <laughs> in Yaoundé. Ask anybody in Boya or in Douala or, or in, 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 in Libreville how much snail is. So anybody who is at home, whether you are in uh, Nairobi, whether you are in uh, Kisangani or you are in uh, Lesotho, you can grow your own small snail. Uh, you can have your own small snail farm behind your house and you grow your snails. And then, you know, you have good protein for you and your kids. When you do little, you do little things like that, then you'll be able to have enough food to eat. And then you have the, the, the liberty to be able to think to grow because yeah. at least you have food to eat. Which is which is the first condition for any country to develop. If you see um, in the United States, what has distinguished the United States with other countries is that the the government or the country as a whole they took a conscious policy to develop the agriculture. That is why you see they are able to do build planes and all because everybody has food to eat. When you eat, you are no longer worried uh, about you know my child not eating or my, my wife not eating. Once you have a full stomach, then you'll be able to think: How can I make a um, you know a cell phone? How can I make an airplane? How can I go to the moon? Because you have food to eat. So it is it is the same um, idea that if our parents, if our family members back at home, if you can, whether you're in the city. If you can, if you can produce your own tomatoes, your own pepper, your own green, your own whatever you want to grow, you can grow it without any difficulty. You just need to know what to do and be interested. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, I mean, <laughs> this is <laughs> like what I see. Sinovia, my sister, is saying this is basic survival skills. And actually, this is the fundamental that even bring us to our spirituality. 
when we're talking about food, like you say in the United States, we're not just talking about food that people just fill their stomach. But imagine you are growing your own food. Yeah. So you control what you eat. Like the snails that you are saying in restaurants here, these are gourmets. These are for the rich people. You can't even buy a plate of snails. But you go to Africa, these snails are just roaming around in the in the in the in the bushes, in, in the water site, and you can see them and they buy them so cheap. So that's one of the commodities that could be really one of the key points to make wealth, build even generational wealth if Africans are conscious, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, um, you know, we have some of our brothers who are, you know, African Americans who are going back on, you know, to the continent, and um, some just go without actually knowing what is it that they can do. You know, I've had people ask me, "What is it that I can go there and do?" You know, these are simple things that you can do. You know, let's take snail for example. You know, you 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 go back there. You you buy a piece of land. You know, in the you know in an area that 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 you know it has conditions. You know, you have to have water and and things like that, fresh grass and things like that. Snails eat trash. You know, um, there, there are certain things that snails don't eat. But if you put in your you know in your snail pen, it's going to kill them. But those are things that can be learned. You know, if you go to um, you know to Bamenda, you see how they throw they throw trash. You know, on the streets, there, there, there are a group of people or young people can go and pick up that trash and use it to feed their snails. And that will be, that will be a big business. You can actually start a farm like that and use just trash that you pick from the dump. And you start a, a business where you can employ younger people, you know, to do these things for you. It is very, very, very simple. You but the snails, are even, the snails even follow that trash. Probably That's right. Maybe because you go around that place, you always see snails. But it's That's just right. that the African is not conscious to see, we see trash as trash, but the, the, the Western eyes or the business people see trash as money, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And let, let me give another example. You know, um, from trash, you can really make organic fertilizer or what they call vermicompost. What, what does that mean? That means that you can have worms, just regular worms. When rain falls, you know, when we're growing up, when rain falls, you see worms all over the place. Mm -hmm. Those worms actually break down every organic material that exists. Mm -hmm. So, that, you know, people, you know, for us to grow our own food and control it, as you said, we can decide now, instead of going to throw our, our trash on the streets and blocking our streets, we can use that trash, you know, to create a compost behind your house and you look for worms and put them there and the, and these worms would break out, will break down this, uh, this trash. And, and, and you have 100% organic manure. That is for our mothers in the village. Um, how about you and I who are in the diaspora, who have a little bit of money? You can go, you know, you, you can go anywhere, whether it's in Accra or it's in Legon or it's in Nairobi or wherever, where we have this trash on the streets. You get a, a half an acre piece of land you know, you employ five, six, seven, seven guys with, um, you know, with a truck and fork. You know, they go to this where the where the where where the, where, where, where people throw trash, collect this trash, and select out, you know, the plastics and the bottles, mm -hmm. and every organic matter. You go and you 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 form beds, and you put this trash there. And you find you 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 get worms. You put them there, and in in three six months. All that trash will become organic manure, vermicompost, which is very expensive. You know, I'll suggest to all your viewers, go on Google, Google um, vermicompost, see how much it is a bag of, fifth of uh, uh, 50 pounds is sold in the US or in Europe or anywhere of vermicompost. So 
These are things that we ourselves can do, which doesn't require any rocket science. Correct. Nothing. Nothing. All you need is, you know, for, for people who don't have money, they can buy trucks. You know, the truck, the push push that, that, that we have at home. You know, you know, you can start small. You buy the push push, you go, you, you pick up the trash, you select, you select out the, the, the plastics, select out the bottles, just you know, put the trash following a certain procedure, you look for worms and put there. And then after two or three months, it's turned into organic fertilizer. You bag it and you sell it to farmers. <laughs> for countries like Rwanda that, 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 that don't have wars or like Kenya or like Nigeria that, that, that don't have wars. Those are things that could be done by anybody. But for us, the diasporans who are for, who are going home to you know for, you know uh, through the African year of return you know to Ghana, those are some of the things that you know we can actually bring to our people. You know you know how expensive organic food is. So if you you're able to produce organic fertilizer, that would cut down on the use of chemical fertilizer. You know how of late people, you know, all these chemical fertilizers, you know, they bring lots of illnesses. You hear can people have cancer here, you know, all these kind of illnesses because of the chemicals that people use from chemical fertilizer. So producing organic fertilizer would cut down on the expenses of medical care for all these diseases that are a result of eating chemical fertilizer. Two, it's going to create jobs. Three, all the money that is spent on importing chemical fertilizer. You know, there are some countries that import fertilizer who don't have fertilizer companies. So for a country that imports fertilizer, that is billions and billions of dollars that it's saved. That money that is used, that could have been used in importing fertilizer to produce food that's going to make us sick, that money could now be used in building hospitals or in building schools or in building good, good roads. And on top of that, you're going to create jobs for our own people. So these are simple things that you don't really need any huge capital or any huge rocket science to do. Our mothers in the villages can do this. Um, you know, the young people in the cities can do this. Um, you know, diasporans who want to go back, that is something that would be a major contribution for our continent. You know, the market is there. For the last 40, 50 years, we have been we have oh, we we have we have been using chemical fertilizer and it has destroyed our soil. So much so that if this year you plant tomatoes here and you put fertilizer, next year if you plant it without that, that same fertilizer, the tomatoes are not going to do well because the soil because the nutrients in the soil are so depleted that you must reinforce it with the chemical fertilizer. Mm -hmm. we can turn that around. We have enough trash. Anybody in Lagos, you know, you know, anybody who is somewhere, they can send you pictures, you know, to, you know, to, your, to, you know, to the chat now. We will see the amount of trash on streets in Lagos, in Yaoundé, in Douala, in Bamenda, in Boya. That is, that is gold. So, mm -hmm. those are the kind of things that um, you know, Amber Farmer's voice tries to raise, you know, to raise the consciousness of our people, our people continentally. You know, it, you know, it, 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 it of the fact that you know, um, Amber Farmer's voice was started because of, of the of the of the of the war in, in southern Cameroons. It has grown to the point where you know you have viewers from Nigeria, from Sierra Leone. From, from even uh, from first speaking African countries like Benin, uh, some of them watch the program. So, um, you know, we're trying to bring this consciousness, you know, in, uh, in food production. 
we can produce our own food. We can we can we can reduce the post harvest losses without buying all these expensive things, you know, coming from abroad. Absolute, wonderful. I mean, another beautiful session here. I see people in the chat saying this is another beautiful, <laughs> another beautiful uh, uh, expert here. And I want to remind you, even though he's the first. Uh, uh, he's been here as an expert for the first time, but he has always been on uh, the Pan-African Daily TV, particularly when issues or topics of agriculture um, are being um, yeah, uh, addressed. And uh, he was one of the ones who said, it's been long, I haven't heard uh, us talk about agriculture. How can we move forward on this very essential topic? Now, I want to just bring something that you said that is very relevant. And, and, and one other thing we should under, uh, understand now, we have the third expert in this sector. So we have Dr. Tata, we have uh, Rotendo, and then we have Dr. Isaac Zama. So you can note them down in case you have questions out there on agriculture, you want to invest in this sector in any country on the continent, or even you in the diaspora. Most of you have homes that have gardens. And you want to, you you know, you you need some expertise that you don't need to go into the supermarkets and buy uh, this a seed or buy the the genetically modified. So you can reach out, drop a message in our WhatsApp group, and we're going to put you in touch and in contact with them. They are ready to help, free of charge, as you know. Good. You touched a very important point, particularly the trash. Um, we have communities in the diaspora, particularly in Germany, where I am. Uh, that are doing projects on the continent. And um, one major city that I know this project because I, I followed up this project to find out. And you see, they tell their people, we are helping Africa clear their trash on the street. We want to clean the streets of Africa, you know, because these people are just dumb. They, they're living in, in, in uh, you know, in diseases. So that's even where the major part of the diseases and illnesses on the continent come from. But essentially, what is this telling you? It's telling you these are companies that are looking for jobs on the continent. Africa is offering these jobs to German companies and who come in to say we're doing projects, we're funding to, to decompose their trash and that. But they make chunks and billions of money. You know, like you even have to pay for them to say they want to come, you know, right. clean this trash. But yes. in the on the, the opposite is you are paying for them to even make money out of your trash. Exactly mm -hmm. what Dr. Lamar is saying. Yes. So what they do actually is clean this trash because a lot of people dump even the waste material, the food material that is, and it's too much money, organic yes. money. Yes. All right. And for us, we look at it and say, we eat, we throw oranges, we throw seeds. In Europe, no, you have spatial containers that you put the organic trash into it because they take it, recycle it into manure, and they grow their food. That's right. But for us, we throw even the money on the street, That's and right. the Europeans come and telling you that you are living in dirt and they want to clean your street, but they make money, billions of money from this trash. So yeah. this educational session here is very relevant for us to understand the tricks, being conscious, don't just see your trash and say it's trash. That is millions that yes. you'll see out there. So over to you, Dr. Zama. I just wanted to bring this example. It's very relevant, you know. Absolutely, and absolutely. Um, you know, the education that we received from home and then to the diaspora conditioned our mind that... Um, you have to go to school, come back, and then you go work, go work in the office nine to five. And and that's it. You know, you, at the end of the year, you make sixty thousand dollars, eighty thousand dollars. You know, you're happy. You know, you're able to send your your, your kids to school, and then uh, maybe build a nice a, a small nice bungalow for your grandma at, in the in the village. And uh, every end of the month, you send her uh, two hundred dollars, and that is fine. That was that. That is the mindset of the colonial education that we have, and so um, I think you know uh, we have to start 
divesting ourselves away from that colonial mindset and trying to see how we can do things for ourselves. And, um, you know, this really ties in with the work that the Pan-African Daily TV and the other um, partners are doing to conscientize, you know, us about the need for us to bring, you know, to build Africa we want. What is it, the Africa that we want? Do we want an Africa where it is a German company that is going to come and clean our streets? Is it, you know, do we want an Africa where uh, we always have to import solutions to our problems, solutions that are designed by other people in Washington that really do not answer to the needs of our people? Let me give you a simple example. If you go to, let me, let, 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 let's, let's take uh, Cameroon as a country, because at least that's the country that I know. If you go to, uh, to Cameroon, you would find what we call white elephant projects that, um, that, 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 that they invested thousands and thousands of dollars. But after two, three years, um, you know, those projects die. Why do they die? The projects die because, you know, there wasn't any infrastructure to really manage those products, you know, you know, to, to, to really manage, um, you know, to cater for the needs of, of those projects. Let's take agricultural uh, projects, for example. You go and you, uh, you, you, you order $5 million uh, uh, tractor for agriculture. You know, you bring it to, you know, to, you know, to an area. You know, you run it for one year and it breaks down. There's no mechanic to repair to repair that that, 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 that that tractor. There are no spare parts. What happens? You abandon it in the bush. You, so that is why I say, you know, we design projects without the infrastructure that accompany these products. I mean, these, these projects. That is why you see all these white elephant projects dotted all over the country or all over the continent. But, you know, um, again, those are things, those are mistakes that, we, that were done. Um, you know, the Pan-African Daily TV uh, with, with, with the host of other partners, um, you know, we're, we're coming out now with, you're, you're coming out now with a new uh, philosophy of trying to see how we ourselves can go back and design solutions for our own people. It is not only us who have to go back. Our parents have the solutions to all our problems back at home. Our people, the solutions to our problems are found at home. I'll give an example why our agricultural uh, sector it's not developing. If you take the the uh, the, the, the 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 American American agricultural uh, sector, mm -hmm. it developed into from it developed into phases. The first phase was that the people were working by hand. Mm -hmm. The second phase, you know, they they, they 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 started using donkeys, you know, to till. The third phase, they went up to tractors. The fourth phase now, they are using IOTs, uh, using uh, computers and all those things. Where from one phase to the next, they had accompanying institutions that accompany that agriculture. Mm -hmm. when, they would, when they were using donkeys, you had companies that would make the plows. You had companies that would make the ropes that, that, you know, that, 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 that will tie on the donkeys. You had companies that were breeding donkeys. And so those were the infrastructure that were accompanying that particular uh, 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 development. Mm -hmm. when, when they moved to tractors, what, what do tractors need? Tractors need petrol. Tractors need um, tires. Tractors need um, uh, 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 iron and things like that. So you had different industries 
that catered for that phase of agricultural development. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, um, you have 20 farmers, when they want 20 tractors, there's a company that is supplying tires, there's a company that is supplying this, there's a company that is supplying that. What do we have at home? Nothing. We are, they, they, they are trying to move us from the phase where our parents are working or, or, or they're tilling the farm by hand to to the to this to, you know to the um, you know to the uh, you know to the phase of using I or the Internet of Things where you're using sophisticated equipment that you don't have the accompanying infrastructure you know to handle some of those things. If you bring a twenty million dollar tractor, it produces. Uh, 60,000 tons of fresh tomatoes or corn. We do not have coal houses. What are you going to do with them? They're going to rot. Because you cannot sell 20 million pounds of tomatoes in one week. What will happen? Mm -hmm. They'll rot. They'll rot. Mm -hmm. You don't have any roads you know, to, to, to evacuate the 20 million pounds of corn or tomatoes you know, from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. What happens? Those things rot. So that, that that's what you, you know we call it the accompanying infrastructure with agricultural development, and those are things that we don't have. From my own point of view, where do I see African agriculture at this point? I think we, we I think we are at the level of the donkey, and if we start from that point. At a level of donkey, where a 60 or 70 percent of our mothers in the village still till by hand. We don't have enough roads, but if we have donkeys, it means that our, our mothers can till maybe one or two, two, uh, two, two, two hectares. With two hectares, they'll be able to manage to, you know, when they harvest their corn, they'll be able to, you know, tie it by hand and put it on their, you know, on their ceiling, you know, for it to dry. You don't have so much infrastructure, uh, a food that it rots because you don't have the accompanying infrastructure. The accompanying infrastructure at this level can be easily developed by um, people who have money. Let, let, let's, let's, let's say the diaspora. The diaspora, let's take the diaspora for example. If um, five people in the village have uh, donkeys that are tilling farms in the village and they are growing tomatoes. We can, you know, people in diaspora can build solar dryers. When you build solar dryers, those are things that are very simple that can cater for the immediate needs of the people at that time. Mm -hmm. So once you do that, you when 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 you stop losing money. When you can grow five uh, hectares of tomatoes, if you don't sell all the fresh, you can solar dry them. It means you're not losing money. Then, you know, on, on a macro scale, the government or the state will now be able to use some of, some of, some of that income that is, that is being generated, you know, to build farm to market roads, to build some, to, you know, to build coal houses, coal storage houses. You know, that then the, 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 the agricultural industry will start developing. But if we have to jump from where our where our food is still, is still being produced by our mothers in the villages with hoes to try to get, you know, $20 million tractors that uses this sophisticated uh, uh, internet uh, uh, computers when we don't have the infrastructure we, you know, in three, four years, that thing would die. That that's a loan that maybe may, may have been taken by a cooperative or by a village or, or by the state. You will still have to pay that loan, and that thing dies, and then we continue uh, living in hunger. That is that's some of this. Those are some of the reasons why our people, uh, you know, uh, our, they consider our, our countries as, um, you know, hunger dependent and things like that. I hope I'm making sense, ma ma Maso. You, you, you make a lot of sense. And you know what? <laughs> You're just talking and I'm trying to uh, visualize it, like visualize it. And it's like, we are dead. We are finished. 
No. <laughs> you understand what I mean? <laughs> because, I mean, yes, honestly, you're just talking, then I look at, wait a minute, okay, yes, we're still doing that tilling with the hand. I know a lot of you watching out there, I know that a lot of you that have bought your, your farms, small farms, particularly when we start, we started the, the Pan-African Daily, and it's a lot of courage that we're encouraging you out there. You know, and, and we would continue to say it. And that's why the teachings and the methodology, how you can group yourself. I mean, when he talked about a donkey, Dr. Zama, it means we can also use the cows. I see in East Africa, yes. they use a lot of cows and stuff like that, because that's yep. what we are, right? Yep. 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 Right, but 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 what I say, I see danger is because look at the area of land that we still have, and that are young people, or we are not paying attention, particularly in this uh, uh, a sequence of the industrialization uh, process that you're talking about. And so, imagine we're talking about China creeping in, you know, quietly. They are first of all many people, so you won't even see them. Yeah. <laughs> like that's that's just a joke, anyway. But of course, they are creeping in. And so if they have the technology, we are finished. What is it that they should we should be doing? Pair up, group up, build communities, yes. start, um, start with cattle. How? You see, um, one, one of the issues, you know, from my own point of view, is that the problem that we have is, the, is our governments. And our governments, because we don't have any vision for, for our separate countries, particularly in the domain of agriculture. I'm going to stick to what I know. Uh, we don't have any vision, you know, uh, for our for you know for, for 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 our countries. The first the first responsibility of a government is to ensure that its people are fed. Correct. Yes. So if, uh, if, uh, if any government on the continent cannot ensure that every single citizen in that country goes to bed with a full stomach, then that, 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 that government has not succeeded or has no vision. We have the land. We have hardworking people. What is stopping us, our, uh, you know, our, our governments? So when when I say all is not lost, is that um, you know in 1983 Ronald Reagan said government was the problem. So how can we as citizens now solve this problem? We can come together and do things by ourselves, especially those of us who are lucky to have been in diaspora. Let me give you a simple example. You take your, your village meeting. You know, you, you guys meet once every month. You know, you contribute money, you build schools, you know, you do this, you know, for, for the village and things like that. How about, you know, we start from that micro, micro, uh, micro community and you see, uh, you, um, you know, your, you know your, 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 your village meeting in the diaspora says, we are going to contribute uh, $5,000. This five thousand um, dollars, we are going to put it into agriculture. We are going to make sure that every single compound in the village has a solar dryer. Every single compound in the village is going to be using organic manure. Every single compound in the village, we're going to buy them two hundred and fifty liter plastic liter gallons. Put it in every compound in the village, so that they can collect. They can use that to collect their own urine or their own urine and use as organic fertilizer. When, when, once we start from that basic premise to make sure that every every person in the village eats well from Monday through Sunday, our people know how to work. They work hard, just provide them with a little bit of support. And these are things that are found all around their, you know, you know, within their neighborhood. We are not asking them to go buy sophisticated things. Let's assume that uh, in terms of um, 
uh, what we call in, in, our, in our place an LGA. If we want to produce lots of corn, for example, three, four villages, they can come together and buy one tractor. You know, on on this this week they go to this village, they till all the farms. You know, next week they go to this village, they till all the farms. It then uh, so you know during the um, you know the, the farming season they go around and they till you know uh, you know the farms. The, you know we can make it in the form of a cooperative. You're not going to do it for free. If your mother doesn't have the money to pay, you say, okay, this is your farm. When it, we, we're going to till it for you, at the end of the harvest season, you'll give us two bags of corn. Simple. So you can produce enough. And then, you know, the next point would be maybe if we produce too much, uh, it's going to rot. Build everybody a solar dryer. If that is too expensive, why don't you, why don't we have two, three solar dryers in every quarter, as we call it back at home, in every village, where, you know, uh, when you harvest your corn, you know, you, 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 you have a schedule. This week, it is for pe the people of this quarter. Next week, it was people of this quarter, so that we don't waste any food. We, we're able to preserve the food that we produce. That once you preserve the food, once you solar dry your tomatoes, your 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 mangoes, your your, your pineapples, uh, your popo, and and all those things that we produce, all those things can be solar dried. So you add value to it. So that in the dry season, when uh, you don't have any of those fruits, you can sell them out at a higher, at, at a higher, at a higher price, at a higher value. That would now inject money into the economy. So, you know, there, there, are, those are little things that we can do to, you know, uh, uh, that we as a community, we as ordinary people. You can do that to your village, and the government will not say, will not come and say, "Don't do this." They will not do it. But if we, as ordinary citizens, I can build a solar dryer for my for my auntie, the government will not come and say that I shouldn't do it. But that is a very simple technology that can really uh, provide good nutrition. You know, uh, we have the rainy season and the dry season. In the dry season, it is very difficult to get food. So if we can use a solar dryer now, you harvest your bitter leaf, you harvest your green, you harvest your njama njama, your tomatoes, you solar dry them, you put them in you know, plastic bags and you keep them. So you know, in the dry season, you, know, you have enough food to eat. You, you can use your solar dryer, you, know, you, you, you cut grass in the, you know, in the rainy season for people who have what what we call hyper cows that produce milk in, the, in you know in you know that produce milk you you cut grass you solar dry them and then you keep it you know you, you sprinkle a little bit of salt on it you keep it in the dry season when there's no fresh grass you take that grass you put it inside water it becomes fresh you give it to your cows you give it to your goat you give it to your pigs um you know, they eat it and you know they do well so that is what I say that, you know, we can develop our agricultural sector without the government. There is a market. There is a market. There are people amongst us who are interested, who know marketing. You have people who, would, once you produce the food, uh, you know, um, you know, you dry the arrow, there are people, uh, you know, dry the bitter leaf. Once you you once you do it once you you do those things well, there are people in diaspora who import those things. Once you have those hygienic conditions and you can produce good quantity, they would import those things to to, to Europe or to United States, and so they, our economy would, would develop. Thank you, <laughs> thank you so so much. But I have one problem. You're talking like you say, I, I'm I'm happy and I'm lucky. I grew up in a village. <laughs> so if I, if I grew up out of the village I would have been like it sounds so real and so good but let's go back to the basics in the village you're talking I'm trying to visualize there's no road mm -hmm. there is no uh, farm land space I'm talking in terms of tractor I'm talking in terms of even this cows 
and coming together as a community. I'm saying it because these are projects that we already had looked into in what possibility. They're not road. You have hilly places. So there's no possibility, even if you buy a caterpillar, it's one road in the village. And yeah. all the other roads are footpaths to the villages yes. or up the hills or in the valleys to farm. That's the first challenge in the village. Number two, in the village, people own their houses and have their small piece of land behind or in different, different places that they go as a group and they farm them. Mothers gather together or the youth and stuff like that. And they bring back those things in the harvest. They take it to their local market. And exactly what you're saying, in the dry seasons, they dry the cassava and then they produce gary. And so it works somehow. For now, it's okay. My problem is the type that you're bringing now it's a type where we have to look at the landscape. The landscape is feasible here. I'm living in a village where it's an agricultural sector, very quiet here. Because I come from the village, I live in the village in the diaspora. There's no way you can take the village out of me. So, right. but you see, this, this farm lands are really located in a spot where you have the caterpillar roads that exactly what you're describing would do from one a, a, a place to the other if it is a corn if it is greens here if it is beans on the continent the first thing they are not roads number two they are not farmland that are allocated to a community that's an industrial program where they they, they they already have this this community planning here we only farm this how do we how would we achieve that yeah it it is it is very easy um, we, we, that, that's why I talk about vision. Mm -hmm. um, you know, irrespective of the fact that we, do, we, we don't have roads, our parents are still able to go to use what we have, what 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 we basically call Okada. Yes. Okada, th those are the motorcycles that do the transport that can you know can go into those bad roads. Um, you know, we are not going to sit down and just you know throw our hands up the air because we don't have you know good roads you know, to take our produce in the market. We can do with what we have. And, um, you know, I talked about, you know, the small tractors, you know, for, for, for the villages. I, I wasn't actually saying that, you know, to, uh, you know, to mean that, we, we, that they're going to have de a design spot for, um, you know, for commercial agriculture. Mm -hmm. We can still help our people with, with the small tractors that will still, you know, go to um, you know, you know, to you know, to the families. You know, each family at home has a small plot in the backyard, and they have a farm far away. That is what I, that's what I'm talking about. You know, uh, it, every family, or I would say, eighty percent of all the families in the villages, they have um, you know, the backyard house. The, you know, the, the the little the little farm in the backyard, and then you have a farm that is two, two, three, four, five miles away. And many people have that. So that, that's exactly what I'm talking about, that, you know, if we have the tractors, you know, um, they can, you know, till farms like that. But if that is, you know, in, that will not work in every community because there are some villages that are very hilly. So uh, we can, you know, depending on the topography of the village, if, if you know, if it's, if it's a project that, that uh, a, a community in the diaspora wants to sponsor, they would, of course, understand, look at the topo topography. If it's a village that is too hilly, we can still get our horses or our cows. They are, they are, they are you know, um, when I was growing up, there was Haifa and there was Swiss, uh, there was something that I used to call Sata um back then that you know brought cows and you know the trained farmers how to use you know cows to till mm -hmm. so there are some villages that would use that technology and there are some that we use um, relatively uh i would say um 1960 uh, tractors that that were small the small uh, massey ferguson that are not very expensive that are our um our mechanics in town can repair and things like that so Depending on where you are, we really do not need a, a top of the line technology, you know, to mm -hmm. produce, um, you know, you know, food or to be competitive. You, mm -hmm. you know, to produce lots of food. What, what, what are the people here in the what, what, what is the West using? They use lots of fertilizer and they use the tractors. Mm -hmm. So if we collect our own urine. 
we have we produce uh, each each adult produce almost two liters of urine a day. So if, if, if you and your wife and your, and your three children, your four children, uh, your five children, you know, if you have a 200 liter gallon, you know, everybody, you know, uh, pees in, in their small bottle and pours it in the, uh, you know, in the, um, you know, in the 500 liter gallon. When it's when when it's when it's time to fertilize, you know, you you would you would you you would you would cut the urine. You take it to the farm, and then you know you you dilute it 50, 50 water fifty uh, urine fifty, and then you, you 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 know you fertilize your crop. You spray your crops, and uh, and then uh, you would have you would still have enough harvest. As, assume that everybody in the village does that. It means that they, they are going to have, uh, you know, good harvests. So this is not only for people who have money to buy chemical fertilizer, because there are some people today who are hungry in the villages because they are not able to buy chemical fertilizer. But if you use, if you collect your urine, you use it, you are going to, that's going to assure you of enough food to be able to feed your family, because that is what is important first. You want to feed yourself first before any extras that you sell. So assume that everybody in the village does that. You will produce a lot of food. And then if you produce a lot of food, you know, you, I know, I know your, your next question is, you're going to ask me is, you know, we, we, we don't have roads to evacuate our food in the market, mm. especially in the rainy season. Well, that's why we have the solar dryer. The solar dryer would dry most of the foods that we have and you know, when you dry most of the food that we have, it adds its value. When you dry your corn or your or your tomatoes or your mangoes or your uh, or, or, or your pineapples, the the motorcycle or the okada, as we call it, would then be able to you know use those windy roads and take it to town. So, you know, um, if we have to think about where we are, how we can use what we have to produce, and then see how we can improve from there. I am not suggesting that people who have money shouldn't start commercial agriculture. That's not what I'm suggesting. What is of importance to me is that uh, I'm interested in, or interested in having every mama and every papa in the village to be able to eat 365 days. That is what that is where if we start from that premise, that every mother in, in the in the farthest village has enough food to um, you know to eat and feed their family and send their, their, their grandchildren to primary school or secondary school, then the people like you who, who, who have the capital can then move on to the next phase and develop the commercial agriculture. Once our mothers are able to produce enough food and they, and, and they get into their njangi or into their community associations where they contribute, uh, you know, they, where they do their savings and then they loan to each other. Once, uh, you, once you have enough food to eat, you can pay your, uh, your, your medical bills, you can save something. Next year, you will have a savings that you can take now and you increase your, 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 your farming acreage. So that is how, you know, we can improve. We can really go to, uh, 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 you know, uh, that's how we can really develop our own agricultural sector. We have to have the vision that we want every person in the village you know, I, I, you know, I'm a village guy. So everything I, I you know, I, I frame my, my questions from, from, from the village perspective. Everybody in the village has enough food to eat. Once they have enough food to eat, the children who are growing up in the household, they, will, they, they you know, when they come up from school, they'll focus because they're they not hungry, they'll be able to study. And for those who are finished, you know, they, they, when they go to the cities, you know, there'll, there'll be when well, there's enough food to eat, you focus. If you are a mechanic, you focus and you become the best mechanic. If you are a road engineer, you know, you are not struggling to feed your family because if everybody has food to eat, then we'll be able to develop. And then, you know, those who have the capital, um, they'll be able to develop, you know, the agriculture, the commercial agriculture that they can export. 
and things like that. Beautiful. Thank you. From, from what I know, the village has, in the area where I, when I was growing, has mm -hmm. a no food. The problem I see you're trying to address or we are trying to address is this urban relocation of the young people leaving the village and being in the cities. Number two, the facilitator that you're saying. I mean, we don't need our mothers now to really be tilling in this 21st yeah. century. It's a yeah. fact. Yeah. But, but that acts, aspect of growing food, if you go to that market where I grew up, there was always food and they throw it. I never remember a day that they, it, it rather, because of this relocation of the young people leaving the villages and all of them now are in the urban cities, then we start hearing about hunger. Number three is the issue of the organic fertilizers, because most of the farms now, when we grew up, everything was just like you were saying, was a good, fine. Nobody even thought about all this. But now when I spoke to my mother a couple of days ago and she told me all of them are relocated now because this fertilizers that were brought 10, 15 years ago by these Western companies and sold it to our government and people bought it and it became so easy, has killed the soil. Yes. And yes. so the seeds that they used to keep in the seasons to re-multiply uh, those seeds, if they had yams, they will have to have the smaller seed for the next season. And everything yeah. was always perfect, whether it's beans or corn or what. I know we used to produce those seeds because I was, uh, I was part of it. I grew up in it. But then later on, just 10, 15 years now, as we can see, everything has just changed. Yeah. And so he, she told me, even if you will produce what we used to produce, everything is just dry. You go to the markets now, they're dry. And then that hunger that you're talking about is actually now in the village. And now they start exporting rice instead of the natural things that they were eating. Now you see even the villagers are eating more rice from China. That's and right. That's so bad. That's right. That's so bad. And then another point, the diaspora particularly the migrant diaspora. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be a conversation that we have to have another day. Now we have uh, uh, African migrant diaspora that are sending containers home. And then what the diaspora is doing now is buying food from here and shipping into those containers and giving to their people. So you have the rice, the beans, the china, the oil. Mm -hmm. and so my, mother, my mother is saying, all oh, these things are things that have just made people become lazy. And then parents who have children out abroad, they get their rice and stuff like that. And you see all these diseases that you're talking about are becoming the new thread of diseases on the continent. How do Absolutely. we do that? <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, um, it, 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 that, that, that's why... Um, uh, I, I, I said uh, we have to have a vision as a as a people. Mm. What is our vision? Um, we have to have a leadership that really cares for the people. If you have a leadership in any country on the continent that cares for the people, they would design policies that are meant to benefit the people. Mm -hmm. You know, you were talking, um, you know, um, about uh, hunger in the villages and, and young people living and going to town, to towns. Why are they doing that? They are doing that because they know that if you go and till the soil, at the end of the harvesting season, you will not harvest enough enough to eat and to sell and make money. So, what's the alternative? The thing that let me go to town, I'll go and do mechanic, I'll do this, I'll go and do this so I can help myself. But if they know that you can grow your corn, you can grow your sweet potatoes or your yams, and you produce enough to eat and, and, uh, and, 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 and sell some and make enough money, many people will not go to town. Correct. That, that, that is a fact. Some will leave, but a majority would stay at home because, you know, it's cheaper. You can still have your food and you can still have your money. You know, um, these days, um, you know, television, you know, there, there, there are people in the villages who can watch television in the villages, who can have, they can still have their Android phone in the village and, and you know, have WhatsApp and, and all those and all the things that, uh, all the trappings of, of the city. 
So, but those things are in the villages. So if they know that I can produce my own uh, organic fertilizer or, or my own warming compost, or I can use my urine uh, and, and create uh, enough fertilizer that would produce me, that would give me 20 bucks of corn on one hectare, that at the end of um, you know the season, I'm going to make 2 million francs. Okay, let, let's take uh, Cameroon, for example. I'm, I'm going to make 2 million francs. Why would he want, why would he want, would he want to go to town? Correct. So um, these are things which, again, uh, you know, you're talking about, you know, some people in diaspora sending sending things, uh, you know, food, shamefully so, sending food back to our people. That comes back again to the education that uh, we had and that, uh, you know, we came to, to you know, to diaspora we had education, yet we are not conscious of the, you know, the effects of set of little things like buying uh, granite oil or peanut oil from here and selling that and sending it down there. It is that is actually destroying our own peanut market because right. you know, um, you know, you buy a, 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 a gallon of two, uh, you know twenty liters or whatever it is here and you send home. It means that the mama in Kambe. Who is uh, who? Who used to make granite oil and sell? Will not be able to, you know, will not be able to sell because sure. you, you 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 have sent a, a whole container of granite oil, and then you know the send to your family, you know they will, they will take some and then you know they put it in one liter in one liter and then they start selling it for uh, maybe uh, a little a little less than what the mama in Kambe is selling. So you have you have effectively destroyed the business. Or of that mama from Kambe who produced granite. So it's the same thing with rice. Once uh, those of us in the diaspora who send uh, what I call it Uncle Ben's or, or whatever, uh, jasmine or, or whatever rice, you are actually preventing the mama in Dup, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Kumbo, who produce rice from selling. Correct. You know, um, that, that even reminds me because you know I, I, I uh, you know I, I, I produced a program on Amber Farmer's Voice on how to grow uh, on on how to effectively grow enough rice. You know, in in different places in Southern Cameroons, it is a, you know this program could be applicable to whether you're in Kenya or you're in uh, uh, Rwanda. You know, it, it, you it, it has certain criteria to grow rice you know to, to to you know to produce enough rice you know you have to have water you have to have you know certain things it lists them out and then you know uh when to plant the rice when to harvest it how to to spot diseases so those are some of the things which you know i talk in amber farmer's voice you know to and let our our, our, our mothers you know they, they they grew up doing these things but there is a scientific way of doing it to ensure that you know your harvest is uh you know comes out uh, very well when do you when do you plant um what kind of diseases uh do do you know if you plant rice what kind of diseases uh, um, you know uh, uh, attack rice what kind of leaves because we have leaves in the villages that uh, uh, um you know um that, that you can use you know, as um, as pesticides. What mm -hmm. kind of pesticides that can you harvest in the village? How do you process it, you know, to use, you know, to pump your tomatoes or your rice? You know, how, what time do you have to uproot the weeds and when do you have it? So when when, when you follow that process, when you, when, when you um, bring that information to people, then you start seeing their uh, you know their harvest improve and then um you know they'll be able to you know they'll, you know they'll be, they'll, they'll be able to stay in the village when we we're growing up there was nobody who was doing agricultural extension service mm -hmm. for our mothers so our mothers you know yeah they, they use ho wisdom but some of them who had that wisdom had uh, you know they've passed on mm -hmm. so in the Western countries, they have the agricultural extension service where you have people who have been trained, they go out and talk to farmers and try to answer questions for farmers. Mm -hmm. Because we don't have those things, 
we can use modern communication technology to solve some of those problems. You know, we have television. Why do we have to spend all our lives watching uh, Brazilian favelas on our televisions, which <laughs> really doesn't help us in any way than, you know, having agricultural programs on your television two or three times a week that shows you how you can make your own pesticide, how you can collect your own urine and use it safely as fertilizer, how you can collect, you know, you can go to the market square when they sweep the market, all that trash, you can collect it and, you know, you make your own organic compost. So those are some of the things which, you know, um, we, you know, especially you of the Africa we want, those are some of the ideas that we have to start expounding without necessarily involving the government. We, we citizens, we can do it. Uh, we have television, we can educate our people and we'll do, they'll do a marvelous job in food production for our people. Excellent. I don't, I don't even know. For me, this is what, when I was talking with the young people of the PLO Lumumba Foundation and we talked about action time and you see the policy and the politics of Africa has drained the mentality of young people to just sit and be striking and be talking about leadership and governance that doesn't feed them, that would never feed them, even in the next decades to come. And so the strategy is how do we go back to these basic things that even the people in the diaspora, the white people are actually there. Look at South Africa, look at Namibia, look at Tanzania. Most of them are relocating, particularly in times of COVID like this. Do you know the type of migration that is going back now to the continent? We are here talking and saying, oh, our diaspora should go back. But I can guarantee if you look at the migration now from the West to Africa, you'll be shocked. And now, and the sectors in which they are programming and they are actually targeted is agriculture. Yes. And now if our people would be busy talking about politics or who wins election, who doesn't, who is still going to be the same bad one and that they will still strike tomorrow or struggle to even or kill and lost their lives to take out of office. Why don't we focus really on this kind of educational sessions and seminars and lectures uh, to actually get our young people off the street, put them back into those farms. We have been talking about the village. You're using the issue of village. I'm telling you, there will be no space. People that are coming on the continent now, foreigners, that they are coming to invade again, another partition of Africa, would be living in those villages. So you even in this township, you wouldn't even have space. And it is very important for us to understand now that the time is now Africa. The time is there's just that time that you have to, I mean, handle everything with care. If you're living in the diaspora, you don't have a piece of land on the continent. Sorry for you. Really <laughs> sorry for you. And not just a piece of land to put a house and say, no, I have my thing. And no, I mean, own that land as much as you can and just be the landlord and not just sell everything and then give it to the Chinese that you close your hands and say, and now I'm the landlord. It's a lot of mistake. Yes. Yes, the, 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 uh, you're, you're absolutely right, uh, Ma Susan. Um, you know, those of us that God has that God has blessed, you know, for us to come here to the to the to diaspora to the West, we, we need to open our eyes on the need of the responsibility that we have, because I think that um, our parents sent us to school to go and learn and come back and make the environment uh, and make our community better. Um, we have come here. We've seen the way things are, are done. It is, our, I think we have the, um, the responsibility to take some of this knowledge back to, um, you know, back home and do, uh, and, and make it better. The idea of complaining that oh government in in, in in Nairobi is corrupt the government in Yaoundé is corrupt the government in in Lagos in Abuja is corrupt doesn't hold sway anymore because you can start from your local level 
you know, you, you can start doing things from a local level that would not necessarily need the approval of the government in Abuja for you to do it and still, you know, have a wonderful impact. Those of us, I believe, now in the diaspora and the diaspora, the African-American diaspora that is going back home, if I had to give one advice, the advice that I would give is that we as a people should, we, we, we should undertake to do, you know, to make Africa an organic continent. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need a lot of capital. It doesn't need any rocket science. God has given us the weather. I mean, the climate, our climate is very, very favorable, whether from Cape Town to, uh, you know, uh, you know, to up north, our climate is very favorable for us to produce our own organic, uh, verb, uh, our, our organic matter, either from composting our feces. Yes, there is a science that has been developed. The research has been done. And it is being used in countries like Uganda, uh, uh, in Kenya. Malawi. Even yes. Malawi. I talked to Malawi today. They're using it already. And, and so why, when, you know, the, the, you see, one of, one, of the, one of the strange things is that, you know, you have little pockets of these things being done in the, you know, in, you know, in, in, in some villages across the continent. But the information is not widespread. So we as a people, as a generation, I think it is our responsibility to, you know, to get this information out to our people who can do these things without the necessary intervention of the government. These are simple things that are, do are, are being done. Let, let's talk about the composting toilets. These are toilets where you can, where, where it is designed and you know, you can have it inside your bedroom. If you follow the process, the protocol, it doesn't smell. You know, it collects the feces. And then, you know, you take it outside and put it on the compost. And after six months to one year, it becomes 100% organic fertilizer. That's one. Two, all our trash for those in the cities... Or those in the villages that we that we, that we you know we clean our streets and, and and all the organic trash, we can collect that and convert it into uh, into vermicompost. That becomes one hundred percent organic fertilizer. Three, we can design systems to collect urine in small villages. And use you know to fertilize our corn, our pepper, our uh, Irish potatoes. As then, if we want to take it further, if for some reason we were blessed that God gave us a visionary leader in any country who comes out and say we are going to adopt the organic system, the design systems that they go into every primary school in the village. And they build what they call diversion toilets, where they collect the urine, they collect the feces, and then you know they take it someplace, they treat it, and they use it now as fertilizer. They sell it out to all farmers. The research, Masuzan and Africa, the research has been done. We don't need to research anything. We just need to take it and adapt it to, 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 to Kenya, to Rwanda, to South Africa, to Mozambique. The research has been done. We don't need to worry about doing it or spending money. No. And these things, I, I mean, all the research, the scientific research, I'm not talking about, um, you know, this is research that has been done by top universities, peer-reviewed, information articles for those in the united states some that are uh, that are that are, are sponsored by the national science foundation 
the National Science Foundation is a top uh, government entity that sponsors research in this country. And the, um, the National Science Foundation has sponsored research on the use of urine here in the United States as fertilizer. And, if, and actually, there are some companies that are using urine as agriculture, you know, for agriculture in the United States. So our people don't need to be afraid that you know um you know you know some 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 somebody would you know some people called me uh, at one time and said um what if somebody has gonorrhea and they, you know they, they use <laughs> yeah you know <laughs> yeah I, that that was a question and that's a legitimate question which i think let me use this opportunity to address it that Correct. what what if somebody has uh, gonorrhea and mm -hmm. you know the pee we collected we we'll, we'll go put it in the you know on the farm the, the science behind every living organism. Uh, gonorrhea is, is a bacteria that is found in urine or, 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 any other, or any other bacteria that is found in urine. So the science behind it is as, as the science behind it is that any living thing needs oxygen to survive. Everything, every living thing. The the, 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 the the gonorrhea, the, the bacteria, whatever, they need oxygen to survive. So if you collect urine that has gonorrhea from a patient that has gonorrhea, if you collect that urine, you put it in a container. Let's, let's take the 250 gallon or 250 liter container. If you put it inside and you lock it tight for two weeks, every bacteria inside it is going to die and it will be safe to use it. The research has been done. It's not me who is saying it. Anybody can go read it. It is there. It is safe. It's being used in the United States. It's being used in Sweden. Um, uh, the urine is being used in Sweden to grow food that many people don't even know. But I, all I can say is that you know, there's a protocol for our, for, you know, for people like us, I mean, for our mothers who want to do it on a small scale, you know, you know, they, 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 it's a very simple process. Very, very simple. You know, I will take boys, for, for example, for boys, it's very easy. You have your Coca-Cola bottle or your Fanta bottle. Okay. You know, um, you know, every young person, if, if there are three boys in the house, everybody has their own Coca-Cola bottle. When you want to pee, you open your Coca-Cola bottle. You pee inside. You know, for boys to pee, it's easy. You just pee inside. You uh, you know you know you close it. it. You know you sleep in the night. You, instead of you know there are still many there are still many village houses in the villages where people have to get up in the night to go pee outside because you know they don't have running water in the house. So you know instead of getting up in the night to go pee outside, you pee in your bottle. In the morning, you wake up. You go behind the house. There's your 250 liter gallon. But a uh, 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 gallon uh, jar, you open it, you pour, you pour the urine inside. Everybody in the house does that. You close it tight. After two weeks, that urine is safe to use for growing tomatoes or growing any food. I know the next question will be, how do we harvest it when it, when it has urine on it? No. Um, <laughs> there, there is a process in place that, you know, by the time the food is ready, you will stop applying the urine as fertilizer. Um, two weeks before you harvest, you don't apply any urine. By that time, the, the tomato or the green or whatever would have ingested all the, uh, all the urine and um, whatever bacteria that will be there will be gone. The rains will wash it and, and the food will be safe to eat. But people drink urine, <laughs> so oh, yeah. oh yes, for, yes, for medicinal. We've seen Indian. Indian is actually they worked on that uh, research and they're doing it a lot, even in Europe here. Yes, you know <laughs> when I was growing up, uh, our mothers when you know they told us that when when somebody was bitten by a snake, also disinfection. Yes, also. yes. When somebody goes to the farm and is bitten by a snake. Your mom would force you and you pee. Mm -hmm. and, and they'll force you, you'll drink that urine. 
and you know, uh, and they said it, it had uh, anti poison, and that is how our parents. I, I saw that when I was growing up in my village. So you know, people, you know, you, you would drink your own urine when you were bitten by a snake in the village. Mm -hmm. So um, urine is not terribly, um, you know, uh, something. Let, let, uh, you know, I, I, this just this just reminded me for people who are on the continent today. I don't know how, how it is in, in, in Nairobi. I don't know how it is in Abuja. But if you go to the villages where people drink beer, where there's a bar, if you go out behind the house where people pee, look at the grass or that spot where people pee. Absolutely. And then, yeah, then look at the grass where people don't pee. You That's see true. the difference. You it see how clear. green it is. Yes, That's and always true. fresh. Yes. That's always fresh. Uh, 360 days a year. That tells you that urine has uh, phosphorus, nitrogen, and um, and uh, and uh, I forgot the, the, the other chemical. Urine has three chemicals, three properties, the, and it is the same properties that this chemical fertilizer that we buy from the store has. So instead of going to buy that chemical fertilizer, you can still use your own urine, and 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 you would have a good harvest. Just as you know something and the best thing is it would replenish our soil so again as i was saying if for some reason we had a, let, let, let's let's take let's 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 take uh let, let's start from the lowest level a mayor or a province or a governor they decide to want to do the, 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 the you know collecting of urine as fertilizer so they can go to the rural areas you know go to all the primary schools go to all the boarding schools and build diversion toilets where it is designed in such a way that when you, when you go to pee you know the pee actually goes down and gets into uh, into a container and there is a company or a group that comes every day and picks up that that uh, you know the urine or 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 the or the or the or the or the or the, or the, um, or, or the compost poop, and then they go they process it, and then they sell it to farmers. You are creating jobs, and then you are using organic material to replenish your soil, and let your people eat good food so that they don't they don't they don't fall sick. So you can see the domino effect all across the the you know the agricultural chain. You are creating jobs for people. You know, you, you produce good food. You you, you have fertilizer that uh, your, your farmers are using. Your yeah, people are not sick with all these funny diseases that are a consequence of chemical fertilizers and things like that. So those are little and practical things that could be done at the local level. As I said, if government is a problem, our parents can do it. People can start doing it individually. And once you start doing it individually from the village or even in the cities, I, I can show you my garden here. I collect my own urine and I use it in my garden here. So people in diaspora, you can do it. And you know, people in the villages can do it. Those are some of the things which I actually explain on Amber Farmer's Voice. You know, these practical things which our farmers, wherever they are, they can do to uh, improve upon, you know, uh, their, their, their farming. Thank you so very much. But I can guarantee you that in the future, just in the near future, all these ideas that we're talking here, uh, people will have to be paid to even buy your urine. I can guarantee you that. To be honest with you, Africans, um, somebody's going to pick this idea, run with it. Before you know, they start selling urine on the continent. And it's, it's, right it's, even. it's possible. These are all the kind of, we don't need to sit here, particularly on the Pan-African Daily, and we're talking about Africa free trade continental area. Those are big machines yes. that are only for these leaders that are sitting there. But now when we develop our own from, from top, from us to us, right? From yep. bottom, and we carry it, you would see the top will come down to buy from us. So we need to be smart. We pick ideas. And when we're talking about urine and we begin to like, oh, it's like, e. this is water that you're drinking. That's right. Urine, you don't produce urine from anything if you don't drink. Yeah. So yeah. You, you just have to understand it is water that you drink. 
and you are a healthy person and yeah. this what goes into your stomach and mix up with whatever components of your healthy living style it's going to produce something healthy right. it is like getting a baby i used to eat fantasy and now yeah. you get a baby you feed that baby well is you're going to you're going to give birth to a healthy baby that's right. everything that comes in our mouth goes out is healthy so yeah. whether it's feces feces is because you add vegetable granite and whatever mm -hmm. so what is it that is like e about it is a mindset it's a conscious thing and yeah. this is what has been it's not something that is falling from someone else it falls out from you from you yes you went and you add caviar and yep. caviar is the most expensive or snails or you drank a cognac and now yep. you have to pee what do you think would produce That's right. right and so <laughs> it, it, it's just a mindset it's a consciousness it's too much ignorance that you know we keep running away from the things that actually are the things that we're looking and the things that we're even buying paying money so I can guarantee you, doctor, thank you so much. It has been very informative for those that have ears. Now we don't run again to beg Africans to, oh, please do this. I think we've been sitting and we're doing our work so much. All of you that are following, you must have learned something. You're developing. If you have questions, please contact us. We're going to put you in contact with these experts. Like I said, for agriculture now, now you know we have Dr. Tata, we have Dr. Zama now, and we have um, a Rotendo who are really, truly organic Africans. Yeah, when we say organic Africans, you can see it even from their Afro, you know, uh, you see you see, Dr. Zama has been so, so cute with his Afro. He told me today he was in the, you know, in the, in the barber shop and had to make sure that he stays organic. So yes, we're looking for leaders that are not westernized. We have a lot of leaders that have been talking, but they're still on the agendas of this government. We're looking for Africans that are Afro-conscious, how to feed yourself, how to do the basic things. And when you're connected spirituality, every little things become much and you're happy and you live a successful life and you even, you know, inspire and have done something to your people. So you're not on survival mood. Survival right. mode means I came into the universe. I just went to school, finished school. I work money, pay my bills, eat, and later I grow old and I die. That's survival mode. That's survival mode. Something <laughs> at, apart from survival mode. So thank you so very much, Doc. You are one of our experts and we appreciate you. And now, what do you want to round up with? Um, um, I mean, you have events also on Amber Farmer's Voice, I guess. And uh, do you have some events that are coming up? How can people join? Or how really it, it can people focus on this aspect of farming, and particularly in rural areas? Um, you know, um, yes, uh, we do have some events that are coming up. Um, actually, uh, Amber Farmer's Voice um, is working on a, on a project uh, right now to um, empower um, 200 Southern Cameroonian refugee women in Nigeria to become beekeepers. Bee. Bee, honey, you know. Yes. Yes, you know, to be able to, you know, to, you know, to be able to produce honey. Mm -hmm. um, honey is one of those products that is very, very useful in, for health, Mm -hmm. uh, there is a good market for honey. Wherever you are on the continent, you can produce honey and you will sell it. So uh, because, um, you know, these women uh, in, in Nigeria who are victims of the war, uh, we are trying to do a fundraiser, a fundraiser through a global giving. Um, the, the, the window for the fundraiser is... Um, uh, uh, September 13th through the 30th of September, uh, we are we are doing a global fund uh, raiser through global. I mean, um, global giving, uh, and our goal is to raise twenty five thousand dollars. You know, to be able to train um, these women uh, to uh, become beekeepers. You know, to, to you know to you know to, to raise honey. Um, there is a company out out here in Maryland. That is volunteering to mentor, um, you know, these women, you know, to teach them how to, you know, build hives, um, how to place the hives, 
what where are the where are the hives supposed to be placed so that it so that it can produce maximum honey what are the conditions of um of of the area that would give you maximum honey what kind of diseases uh you know affect or attack honeys so all that training um uh this company has has uh, uh, has graciously uh, volunteer that they're going to train these women if we can raise the funds, you know, to, um, you know, have these women, you know, start becoming beekeepers, you know, to buy them bee suits and, and all those things. Um, you know, we are open, you know, to share information with everybody in the continent. The continent is so huge that we are not going to waste our time and saying we are hiding information. No, the, you know, we cannot, we cannot meet one eighth of the market in just Accra for yes. honey, just for honey, just for mm -hmm. Accra alone. So, you know, people out there that, you know, uh, you know, if people want to learn certain things, we have done a program on Amber Farmer's Voice, how you can become a, 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 a successful beekeeper. If you want to, to you know, you want to um, raise honey, we have done a program there. It's on our it's on our YouTube page. If you go there, you see how to um, how to become a beekeeper. It's you know it gives you step by step, step by step how you you, you know how you build your hives, uh, what kind of uh, environment is conducive you know uh, for bees to to thrive in, um, uh, what what uh, what kind of flowers if you you need to plant because you know that that is something which I realized. You know, I've gone to many bee farms in this country. And the farm, the bee farmers, they actually plant flowers, even though their beehives are in some forested areas. And so when, when you know, when, when I inquire to know why, they say that these, these flowers are flowers that will attract lots of bees. They produce lots of nectar. And so they get mm -hmm. lots of honey. Sure. sure. So those are, those are things which, you know, when we were growing up, our parents would just go and put a hive in the forest. You know, they would, they would, they would, they would, you know, um, you know, there are certain things that they didn't know that if they did, it would produce, uh, you know, it would give them better harvest. So, you know, we are lucky, at least uh, we are lucky that, you know, we are talking to, to professionals and they are, you know, teaching us some of those things. And we, we, you know, we come on Amber Farmer's Voice, we break down these things for uh, our people to understand and do them and and so you know there, there, there are people who are actually you know doing some of the things that um you know uh that that that, that we talk on, on on amber farmer's voice so now that we have the knowledge how can we empower our people you know especially um, for people who know what it means to be a refugee in a different country where you've lost everything you don't have food to eat. You know, you're, you're, you're with kids. You know, you don't have any money. So um, we are trying to empower 200 women. And why women? Um, there is ample research. For lost Southern Cameroonians, uh, we have sponsored projects. And the projects that uh, we sponsor for the refugees, those that are done by women are always 100% successful. It's a but fact. Of course, it's, it's not just Southern Cameroonian. It's yes. Africa. The Africa is poor today because the women and not engage. They don't. They don't engage the women, and that's that's the that's the fact. And so uh, we want to change that. This uh, fundraiser, as, as I said, uh, we want to empower two hundred, um, you know, uh, refugee women in Nigeria. You know, to train them to become beekeepers, and once they succeed, you know, they'll put them in form of a cooperative. Once they succeed and they start making money, then they will start plowing back. They will start helping. Of that, so it will have a domino effect. Um, so that th that is, um, you know, one of the projects that we have, um, you know, in the, in the pipeline is going on now. Um, you know, people can find more information about this on um, Amber Farmer's Voice uh, Facebook page, or if they go to a global uh, global giving uh, website, is is globalgiving.org, and if you if you if you search for um, uh, Cameroon refugee women, uh, you would see the, the project there and. 
uh, you know, you can you can support with ten dollars. You can support with twenty five dollars. Whatever amount you support would 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 would, would be very helpful, and uh, it would go ahead to you know to support these women, you know, to become beekeepers. And uh, and so um, you know that's uh, one of the things that we're doing. Um, you know, you know, within this short period, um, another thing to which we are planning uh, with um, uh, one one of our, one of our dear sisters. Um, who did contact us? Um, she's an African American, and um, you know she's trying to put together a package for um, for for our diaspora and African Americans who want to go to the continent, to, you know, to to you know who want to move back to the continent. She's she's interested in agriculture, so she is putting together. Um, uh, you know, uh, she and Amber Farmers Voice they are putting together a, a package uh, that would help orient. You know, the African Americans who want to go on the continent in the domain of agriculture. For those who are interested in agriculture, what is it that they can go and take a look at and maybe do? So those are some of the things that we are working at. You know, to help our own people, not only the African Americans but anybody in the diaspora. If you've been here for twenty years and you want to go back home and you are interested in 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 in, in, in getting involved in you know in agriculture, what are some of the things that you know, um, that are, are very, very marketable that you can grow and you can sell. That's, that's, that's a good market for it. You know, those are some of the things that, uh, you know, we are, uh, Amber Farmer's Voice uh, is, you know, is, uh, is willing to, you know, to share its, uh, its experience with other people. Even though uh, we are going through this trauma of a war, um, we are still part of, you know, the greater African continent and we want to contribute our own bit in the development of agriculture of our mother continent. Good, thank you. Of course, so on time, so on spot, you hit the two hours. Remember I told you in the beginning, <laughs> in the yeah. private conversation, it looks so small, but it's <laughs> when we started, we could even roll up to, you know, the whole half of the hour. I mean, this was very interesting. Tomorrow we're gonna be talking also uh, with our elder in the Americas, uh, in the diaspora and his project is one dollar one africa um we already shared that uh, information on our youtube channel for those of you that are watching the pan-african daily for the first time remember we're running the one million subscribers campaign to raise the awareness and to reach out to our young people and to move africa forward it's a number of talking now we're doing strategic things that people should be doing you know, we're not going to, we know, we know we can lie to ourselves that we're going to remove all those power machines on the continent if uh, politicians should do that work. But we are the commons. We are for the voice of the voiceless. And what we're doing is just looking for strategic things that work on the continent. Yep. Like you said, we're not looking for these elephant projects. All of them are fake. These are all things that they faked and lied to our governments and invest in this. Oh, we're going to give you tractors. We're going to give you buses. If you go to Cameroon, there's a whole sector where you have about 100 buses that were shipped, I don't know, for whatever project that they did for years. And there's been grass inside and whatever. So, you know, they come and sell all this uh, developmental industrial, uh, industrialized concept of agriculture, of, uh, of transport, of this to people that are living a practical life, people to people. So some of these projects are not uh, uh, reflective of our day and work life on the continent. So we thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zama, because you're a son of the soil, grow and raise up in the village and, and, and out in the diaspora is an expert, a PhD researcher and be doing great, great work in your communities on the continent to help your people. This is actually what we're talking about, leadership. This is about what we're talking about, the Africa we want. We don't just need only professors or people that will talk and just talk, but we also touching the professors also with the PhDs that are doing the, like I said yesterday, the PhDs. Are yeah. the ones that are actually uh, uh, changing uh, the narrative. So Africa is blessed. We are gifted, be it in the diaspora, around, across the globe. Every Africa counts, and we're all um, having this expertise. So we thank you so very much for being here. And that uh, now you've just added uh, uh, a repertoire of our agricultural experts doing it for themselves by themselves in a very practical and in a local way. 
Like I said, again, if you want context, how to reach out to Dr. Zama, as he has already said, you can Google him. He's a very famous expert. I mean, all the Southern Cameroonians and Cameroonians and West Cameroonians know uh, Africans, Ghana or whatever, because he's been doing projects out here. They all know him. But if this is your first time of getting to know this handsome young guy sitting here and you don't know how to get access to him, please contact us. And, uh, you know, we're the middle point. We're the facilitator. We take and give. We're going to put you in contact with them. So thank you so very much. Tomorrow we're going to see us on uh, on this topic, One Dollar, One Africa. How did actually our village communities uh, start by just putting their small, small jangis, like he was saying, some call them the tontin, some call them, I don't know, in every community on the continent, they have a name for it. Yeah. And this were local banks that need no collateral. Most of them were even, they didn't even know how to write their names, and but they put their monies together. And this is the most powerful injection on yeah. the economy of the continent that nobody's talking about. You're gonna hear about all those big things, African continental free trade area. I mean, and you look at all this and say, they're such so, I don't know how to call that word going to borrow from, uh, from from China, you don't even know what your community has. Go to the local women. They yep. can produce those money from you, cash. Yes. They're not even going to take it from any bank. Yes. They have it. They pay you. They give it to you. Yes. <laughs> our, right. Our, our mothers, um, <laughs> you know, our mothers, as I say, um, they know what to do and, 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 and they can do it. So, um, you know, we, we just need to, you know, to be able to learn from our mothers and we'll see the wonderful job that they are doing. We just need to support them. Of course, they've been doing it. I know a lot of parents that are sponsoring their children in the diaspora, lazy people that cannot pay their rent or even work or because this is the situation. But in the villages, their parents send them money here. So Africa is not just this uh, stereotyped Africa that you've been taught or you've been brainwashed that the people are hungry, the people are dying of this, the people have no money, their leaders are only borrowing from China. The leaders are borrowing from China because they also, has, you know, they, they have their own uh, concept why they do it. But go down to the villages. They own their houses with no mortgages, yep. right? They own the farms and they are not on mortgages. It is their own. If a person says, I have a house in the village, is one of the richest person because yeah. it's not a bank that owns that house. It is his yeah. house. It is his phone line. So please, Africa is the Africa that you need to rediscover now. Get connected spirituality. Know your roots. Know the powers of your ancestors. And I mean, not just the ones that have transisted, but even the ones that are still there. The right of passation is still there. Go back home. That is where your, your umbilical cord is. It doesn't matter. Okay, so thank you so very much. We're going to meet ourselves here with uh, Elder Marvin L. Gay tomorrow, who is going to tell us about his project on One Dollar One Africa. And Dr. Zama, it has been a pleasure. We're going to have you again on the show on another topic that I've seen you working on, which is very, very re uh, realistic and practical. And I think the, the young people need to get engaged on this. So thank you so, so very much. Good night. All right. Good night to all of us. Thank you, thank you, Mar Susan, and thank you, for, you know, to the viewers, you know, for having us. Um, it was a pleasure, and I hope that um, you know they learned something from, you know, from our discussions this evening. And uh, we're available to come every any time you need us. When it concerns food, I'll be there. Thank you, and good night to all of you. We see us tomorrow. Okay, bye. Bye. <laughs> You are watching the Pan-African Daily TV with Dr. Susan Tata. The Africa we want. Unity. Consciousness. Our culture. Our spirituality. Our history. One Africa for Africans worldwide. Motherlands calling its diaspora home. Join my voice. Join my team. Join my campaign. Campaign 21 hashtag 1 million subscribers on the Pan African Daily TV YouTube. Be a volunteer. Apply now. Be the new Africa.